Hi, I'm Morgan Quaid, creator and writer of The Blood Below, Shadow's Daughter, Whiplash, uh, and many more titles. Uh, you can find me on uh, morganquaid.com and follow me on social media. I also have a Kickstarter coming up uh, next month, which you'll find details about uh, on morganquaid.com. Uh, you're watching Two Geeks Talking. Have a great day. Good morning, afternoon, and evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today on this Two Geeks Talking interview with a very talented and creative person, as they always are when they come on this particular show, because we are joined by a multi-talented writer and comic writer as well, too. Uh, he has written so many works that I can only list three in his lower third. So we are joined today by the ever-talented Morgan Quaid. How are you doing today? Hey, how you going, Kurt? Thanks for having me. Nice Great to be here. <laughs> so for those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking. Right. Well, I am a uh, writer and uh, music producer and composer, um, and I write primarily novels, fast-paced uh, urban fantasy novels and graphic novels and comics, um, and the weirder the better in, in my book. So, yeah, and that's, that's me. All right. Then now I have to ask, what's the weirdest story that you've written that maybe you haven't quite published yet? Oh, see, that's a really good question. It's probably not that weird, but it's the one that I keep going back to. And it's an early book that I wrote that I now hate because it's one of the first ones I did. So it's <laughs> terrible. I need to redo the whole thing. And, but the central idea is, is they invent a drug in the future that eliminates the need for sleep. So no one sleeps anymore. Everything is 24 hours. You can talk to Beijing from America or wherever. So business goes off the charts uh, everything is 24 hours they build new houses without bedrooms because there's no need anymore you know all the so the whole world changes at a certain point people start experiencing psychotic breaks and the sort of unconscious desires start coming through in very <laughs> unhealthy and psychotic ways uh, and the whole story is about this crusty ex-reporter who is one of 0.001 percent of people that the drug doesn't work for and he's an insomniac so while everyone else is not sleeping, he's not sleeping as well, but desperately wants to sleep. And of course, there are lights on all the time. It's always daylight, basically. And this poor guy is miserable and, you know, <laughs> hates his life because he can't sleep. But he is the one that uncovers that there's something going on and the government is keeping a lid on this um, burst of the unconscious. And the whole, the whole premise is that when the brain doesn't have a chance to unwind the unconscious, uh, it sort of things get pent up and then they sort of flash out and, you know, so that that's not too weird, but that's, that's the idea that I've, I've got to get one of these days, write it, <laughs> but it's just, for some reason, it's, it's the one that I just can't seem to get to, but it, it'll happen someday. I'm sure in, in some format or other. Maybe. Well, so, sounds like maybe it should just be, it should be a comic book or something, you know? Well, I think I might go comic book just because it, yeah, it would be easier for me to visualize and get it out there without stressing about, you know, a 90,000 word novel to add some weird, the comic series, the blood below. One of the weirder things in that that happens fairly early is the main character, a detective investigating a homicide has to get information out of this creature who is essentially a hobo, but is not a hobo, is actually a being from another world. And the currency that they use is appendages. I'll say it that way. So basically he walks around with a baggie that, that has a severed um, big toe in it. And that's what he gives to the guy as a, can you do me a favor and give me some information? And so that's a, <laughs> that's a bit weird. You know. uh, we haven't even talked about your other books yet either. I mean, so we're, we're just going to, we're going to scrape the surface of your psyche in the first half and then dive into <laughs> introspective in the second. So that should be fun. Yeah. Yeah. But, but there's something to be said about being creative and in, in the minds of, of madness and, and creativity is that there's a fine line between that and, and insanity as well, too. I think I've heard that being said somewhere or maybe yeah. I just came up with that, but um, <laughs> Who sure. knows? When you initially scheduled this particular interview, you had plans for releasing some comics. So what's currently being released that that is public knowledge and that you'd like to promote? And then we'll talk about your other works as well. 
the last campaign I ran was for Shadow's Daughter, which is that little puppy there. Um, so it was, it's six books, um, uh, some black and whites, and then two two color issues. So that was that was the last campaign that I think when we made contact, that that was what was running out. So that's available now. The digital copies are all available on Amazon or, or wherever you get your digital comics from. And then I'll be running another campaign at the end of the year for the next batch, uh, which will hopefully be an omnibus version of those. What I have coming up next month in August is a series called Emnity, um, which is. And the story behind Enmity, it's a pretty simple story. Essentially, it's a, it's a young girl, uh, not a young girl, a 16-year-old girl searching the post-apocalyptic world to try and find her deadbeat dad. Her mother has died and, and said, you need to find your father. And so she's searching for her father. The twist on that is that her father happens to be Lucifer. Um, and Lucifer happens to have caused the post-apocalyptic <laughs> situation that now exists for essentially failing to do his job because he's decided I'm done. I don't want this anymore. I'm bored. So he just stops doing it. And because of that, the equilibrium between heaven and earth is kind of busted and, you know, chaos ensues. So it's all about her journey to find her father, but it's also about her figuring out who she is and, and um, what that means. And of course there are kind of demonic figures trying to kill her as well, because that's what happens in a post-apocalyptic world is that you have fallen angels that turn into twisted representations of their former selves trying to hunt down 16-year-old girls because of their heritage. That'll be seven comic books. So two in the main series, a side issue called Kira Burns, uh, which is a... I always do this. I put stuff out without thinking about how do I do this without spoiling... Uh, essentially, Kira Burns is about a, a girl named Kira who is in the same world, but in a separate sort of area, experiencing similar sort of things. Uh, I'll just say it. Daisy, the main character in Enmity, is not the only daughter of Lucifer <laughs> around. Uh, and so Kira is another one. So you find out as the story goes on, there's more of these, these kids uh, uh, or young people, you know, to save humanity from what's coming, they need to sort of band together and all that sort of stuff. And they need to somehow find their dad and convince him not to be such a deadbeat. So yeah, so there's a side issue there. There's also another little side issue called Crow, which is about a, a figure who inhabits crows, who is kind of this angel slash demon figure. who's a bit of a rogue character. And another one that I just started with an artist uh, called Raven Running, I think is, is what it's called at this stage. So that, so, so it's, it's kind of like a suite for the, you know, for the whole thing uh, rather than one book, but it, it's, it's a really cool story. It's lots of fun, lots of action and that sort of stuff. So that's coming up in, in um, August, which I'm looking forward to and frantically preparing for now. Yeah. So that's, that's probably where I'm at at the moment. And then novels I'm, I'm releasing um, all the time at the moment. Uh, the, the Seven Hungers is kind of the main one that I'm putting out there quite regularly. So there's another one of those also dropping in August because it strikes me as marketing genius to do everything at the same time and not split things out and give adequate time for people to get used to stuff. Just, just throw it at everyone, throw every, everything at once. That's a genius marketing idea. So, something but anyway, will stick, right? That's right. If you don't like novels, then you like comics. If you don't like comics, you like novels. Maybe I'll throw some music in there as well. There you, go. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'll catch everyone for something. Maybe some tapestries. I don't know. Sure, why not? And, and <laughs> a kitchen sink as well, too. You know that. I'll that, throw that that's... in. Yeah, uh, that'll Free. be a tier. That'll be a high tier as a kitchen sink. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's a lot to go over we have a limited amount of time but but at least now i have a good idea of, of where at least creatively you are currently and i'm sure that'll change in in a couple of months as well too looking at yourself as as a creative person that you are what is your creative kryptonite it's probably similar to a lot of writers it is i am midway through a book or halfway through a book or something like that and an ad will come up on Google or wherever for a movie or a film or a comic that looks eerily similar to what I'm working on. And so I'll investigate, I'll have a look at it and it will either, in most cases, it's like, oh no, that's different enough. It's fine. I'm, I'm okay. Or sometimes it's like, oh God, this is the idea <laughs> that I I've been playing around with and they've already done it. And it's just being released now. And that kind of hurts for a little bit. Um, and then the other thing is just negative reviews, which don't happen that often. It's that whole, we're, we're wired, I think, biologically 
that uh, you get a hundred great reviews and then one not so great review. And most, most of the no, not great reviews are, ah, oh, yeah, it just wasn't my thing, mm. which is perfectly legitimate, but it's still like, but why isn't it your thing? What, 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 what bits aren't your thing? Why, 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 what, you know, it's like your brain still can't understand, but how can anyone not like this thing that I love so much and that I've invested so much in, but it's, it's the reality of, you know, being published and getting your stuff out there. A bunch of people aren't going to like it. And the interesting thing is people that will go to the trouble of buying the book or getting a free version if you want to give away or whatever, and then go to the trouble of reading it and then keep reading it and then go all the way to the end and then write a review that says, uh, it wasn't my thing. It's not, this isn't my style. If it's not your style, why are you reviewing it? Just, just throw it away or don't read it or, or you know, or just read it and keep it to yourself. But it's, it's this thing of, you know, no, I need people to know that this isn't the sort of thing I normally read and I don't really like it. <laughs> Those can, can be a, a bit of a kick in the guts. Um, but for me, usually my, my ploy to get out of that is just keep producing, keep, keep pushing, keep, you know, so it tends to be a bit of a, a quick dip and then I'm up again and I've got too much to do to wallow in, you know, <laughs> All of it, self sorrow and all that stuff. Being that you're creative in two areas, both writing and, of course, music, what energizes you more, writing or music? Writing, hundred percent. It would it would have to be writing, a long term scheme, I suppose. So, music can very quickly ignite passion and get me excited about something, but for me, it's over very quickly as well. Um, whereas writing tends to be a much longer burn and then music is more of a commercial success for me and it's a, a way to generate income to help support the comics and all that sort of stuff. Um, but I don't get the same interaction from fans. I don't get people saying, oh, I love this idea. Even editors, even getting a note back from an editor that'll say, I'm not saying anything negative about this. I just loved it so much. I just wanted to tell you that this thing that you wrote here was really great. Or, or, you know, I'm laughing, you know, so hard at this thing here. That stuff will keep me going for months and months and months and months and months. Whereas people just buying music isn't quite as, um, I don't know, it doesn't, doesn't have the same uh, impact, but I love both. And I'll, I will swap from one to the other occasionally. If you know, the writing is getting a bit depressing, I'll just swap over and do some music and then vice versa. But yeah, the writing is the main thing. That's what, that's what stokes the fire of imagination and, and such. Well, I, I always found it interesting uh, because you're the second person that I know that works in prose and comics and is also when it comes to both writing and music. So I think that's, mm. that's amazing to see. And I'm, I'm really surprised that there isn't more dual creators like yourselves uh, out there, or at least mm. maybe they're not showcasing their musical side when I speak with them. I don't know. It could be. Yeah. I think a lot of, a lot of people have got guitar around the corner or, but maybe they're wanting to keep the two separate or something like that for, for a long time. That's what I was doing. I was keeping everything separate and running multiple social media accounts and again genius marketing ideas split everything up into small bits so that no one can find you just a great idea so it's only recently that i've figured out hang on let's just put it all together yeah. and then people can find me that way so it could be a bit of that i think we we suffer from shyness uh, or, or a, a reluctancy to get our face out there sometimes and we want to hide behind the work and a lot of creative people are introverted in nature whether they're a musician or whether they're a writer or artist or whatever it seems to be a common trait where we don't take praise well but when we do it's great <laughs> so it yeah. kind of helps our creativity but it can also stifle us as well too if we maybe receive too much I, maybe that's just me i don't know yeah and it's, it's the same with selling it it's the same as the first time you go to sell your product even thinking of it as a product feels dirty and wrong and you know filthy and you know I, I, I would love to give it away. If someone would just pay me to do my art that I would give it away because I don't want people to have to pay for the stuff. There is a real hurdle to get over. And like you say, I think, yeah, most artists ha have that, that issue with, I just want to make this beautiful thing and offer it to the world. I don't want to have to grind a living out of flogging this thing to people, you know? Yeah. 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 And you're right. I think we do more inside of our mind than out of our mind. So that's where the creative engine is and that's where we do all our thinking and planning and all the rest of it. So yeah, maybe lends itself more to the introvert than the extrovert. Being that you're 
uh, you've worked in in prose and comics. I'm always curious about this process, especially from a creative perspective. Uh, what's the hardest part for you? Is it the beginning, the middle, or the end of your process? Say when you're creating a story. Probably the middle. The the beginning is the easiest thing in the world. I can begin a million things. Um, <laughs> I'm very good at beginning. I'm incredibly excited at the beginning. Uh, so what I will usually do is once I've got an idea. I will run and run and run until I'm out of steam and that will get me through the beginning and right into the middle. And that's where I've created the problems and now I need to sort them out and somehow figure out how am I going to get my protagonist out of this in a way that makes sense, ingenious and cool and wonderful, but also, you know, the reader's not going to be thinking, well, that's just stupidly convenient, you know, all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, the middle is the bit where untying the knots that I've tied to get to there once that's happened the ending just writes itself because once you've sorted out who's going to be where who's going to be doing what to whom what's the the central crisis that's going to be resolved or not resolved then it's just a matter of okay i know where i'm going i just i've just got to physically do the work to get there which can be a little bit of a grind my last book was it three yes so book two of the seven hungers is just about to come out uh book three i've finished because you're always kind of ahead of what's what's being released book three was a struggle it's a great book and there's so much in there but it's getting to the point in the series where a lot has happened so you can't just simply do whatever you want there are things you have to remember and that you've got to go back to and there was also it's I, I want it to be unique and different but it's a different kind of enemy it's a different situation than what the, the characters have been in before how, how the hell do i how do i get through this and that that took a lot a long time just to of thinking through what works what doesn't and then eventually it'll you know that for me that's the writer's block writer's block for me isn't not knowing what to write it is i'm stuck with plot points and i don't know how to unravel them in a way that makes sense and then when you get when you find it it's great because you think ah oh, that's great now it's just now it's just words now i've just got to get the words down but the ideas are there i'm, I'm fine Let's list what you've done so far, because that's that'd be a good starting point. You talked about Shattered Daughter, Whiplash, The Script of Rebellion, Rust Chronicles, Idol Thuggery, <laughs> Amenity, and that seems to be about what I can see on your, your website. The Rust Chronicles, uh, Script of Rebellion, Whiplash, they're all kind of part of the same universe. So there's novels, comics, short story um volumes that are all kind of collected to this world that's my big tent pole thing is that what they say in the entertainment industry I, I think seven novels that are already written but they're slowly being released 15 odd comics um the script rebellion is a it's that one that one there it's really cool artwork anyway that one's uh, a short story originally from that that universe that got you know that i made into a, a graphic novel or a graphic novella it's not a huge graphic novel they're all part of that. And then each of the others are separate um, stories. So then out of all of these, what is your favorite series that you've created and which one would you like to revisit and maybe redo? A favorite one would be The Blood Below. So the, the protagonist in The Blood Below is a, is a crusty kind of detective who says the things I can never say and would never say. <laughs> um, he has no real filter. Uh, he, and he's such a joy to write for because he will just say whatever comes into his mouth um, and do whatever he, you know, in, in service to solving the crime, he'll do whatever. So that the whole story behind the blood below is he finds two dead bodies, one in a dumpster with its like the internal part of the body just ripped to shreds. And another is a young woman that's just dead with no sign of trauma or anything like that. So there's a bit of a mystery going on. The only clue that he finds is his little lens case next to the dead guy with the, the hole in his, in his stomach. And the lens case has these, these lenses in them. So in the future, they, they develop these lenses that give you 20, 20 vision or better for 20, 30 years, but they're very expensive. Uh, so they sort of semi-permanent and these are a pair of those lenses. So his bright idea is all the leads have dried up and his idea is I'm going to stick these into my eye and then see if I can, see through the eyes of the the victim you know that old chestnut which of course he knows is dumb and that, that's not going to make sense it's just a stupid hollywood trope but he does it anyway but of course while he's doing it he's in the bathroom at the precinct um with a butter knife and one of the lenses on the thing he drops the first one you know curses puts the next one on and while he's 
gently putting it to his eye because you're supposed to use specialized equipment to do this there's a whole thing one of the other officers comes out of the stall and slaps him on the back to say good day and he sort of jams it in his eye wrong and the long and short of it is it it doesn't show him what the victim saw but it opens his world to this kind of supernatural it opens his eyes to this supernatural world where things are not what they seem so he's got one eye that's just normal and one eye that that sees into this supernatural realm it gets weird very quickly um, it's part of the Rust Chronicles universe as well. So it, it goes into the central premise of the Rust universe is there is this dream reality that is comprised of dream matter. So every time we go to sleep and we might dream of London or New York or, you know, whatever city we're, we're near or in, as we're dreaming that we're, we're fabricating part of that city or a representation of that city within the dream world. So it's this world that changes and goes up and down and all lots of stuff but at the center of this dream world is this city that they colloquially will call rust and it's called rust because it has these big rust colored walls of of pitted metal all around it and so no one remembers what what the real name of the city is they just call it rust and it's a city in the middle of rebellion it's uh, ruled over by this um domineering queen and her cadre of sort of demigods uh, and essentially people are dreaming themselves into this city and then waking up again. But some of them now are not waking up. They're dreaming themselves in there and dying. And, and that's happening more and more. And so every, all of these different stories either take place within that city or within the real world and sort of going backwards and forwards. So I love that story because of that, because uh, it, it's part of that universe. I love it because the protagonist is just amazing to write for. Our work is amazing. Our artist named Willie Roberts is a good friend of mine. He, uh, he did the artwork for that. Just the look and feel and vibe of it all. It really, yeah, just works well, probably better than anything else I've written. I think it just kind of really gels well. Yeah. So that's really solid. I'd like to redo it, but I'd like to redo it as a film script or a mm, animated series. Yeah, I think it would think it would. Well, I mean, I'd like to do that with all my stuff, obviously, but <laughs> but that that one in particular, I really like the idea. One that I am going to redo is Shadow's Daughter, the original two comics. Yeah, they were really early on that I started those. So the artwork is good, as solid. The lettering is okay. I did the lettering. It was my first attempt at lettering, so it could be better. So I'm actually for the next version going to go back and redo all the lettering, um, change some of the artwork here and there. If I had the money, that would be one that I would probably redo and repackage all together. Um, but we'll have to see what future holds for that one because it's horrendously expensive, as we know, to um, yeah. redo everything. Yeah, that's right. You have passion. I can hear the passion in your in your voice, and the fact that you've created all of these works shows that you're you're well invested creatively into these worlds that you built as well, too, which I find truly fascinating. Just in your your descriptions alone, like I see the twinkle in your eye and the sound in your voice. So I definitely hear your enthusiasm for what you've created, which is always wonderful to see. Themes are always an important aspect when it comes to to creating the worlds that you've built as well, too. And and some themes maybe speak to you in what you created more so than others. What are some themes mm -hmm. that seem to kind of continuously reappear either subconsciously or consciously in your works? I'd say one is definitely a fascination with dual worlds or dual realities that are uh, impinging on each other or colliding. Um, that's, that's consistent throughout more or less everything that I've, that I've written in one way or another. I like things to do with the moon or lunar aspects, partly because I think that is um, a real life uh, example of seeing another heavenly body and it, like the only one that we can really see close there and sometimes quite large. So it's kind of a visceral connection to that other world that's impinging. I also like anything to do with shadows or darkness, the living darkness, those sort of things. So a, a thing that doesn't have a personality actually having a personality, mm -hmm. um, like living shadow. I, I like those sort of themes um, quite a lot. And that, that tends to pop up. And then the other thing, my protagonists, most tend to be female, a couple of are male. They all share a smart mouth <laughs> and regardless of what danger they're in and how detrimental it will be to them, they will always say something smart at the wrong time. They will always voice, you know, they're, they're a little bit more id than, than ego. If I can put it that way, they're, they're, they'll just say whatever. And 
somehow get out of the trouble that they're in 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 the end because i i think again that's there's something cathartic about writing that because that's not what i can be it's you know partly maybe what i would like to be and it's great fun to write for as well i i really don't want to write for a button down controlled very strict person not as the main protagonist anyway i want to write for someone that is just chaos to be around uh, because they're fun. Same with the villains. You know, you want you want them to be to be fun to write and enjoy and read and all the rest of it. So yeah, so they're probably the main themes that I keep coming back to, no matter how hard I try to go anywhere else. <laughs> I just keep coming back to them. But it works for you. It works for your style. It works for your mm. creativity, and it works for your varying character because they're you're consistent. It, it makes you keep writing and makes you keep mm. being creative. So at least you don't get bored. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I've done a few times I've written projects that I didn't want to write just to sort of stretch myself as a writer and all that sort of stuff. The passion projects, the things that I love, you're exactly right. I want to make sure that I'm enjoying them. And one of the ways to do that is I write characters that I like, that I would want to hang out with, you know, in the real world. Although maybe not with the life-threatening situations that they tend to get involved in, but you know, so, yeah, yeah, I think you're right. And you've got to keep it interesting because, the, the, you know, writers are, are first readers. I'm the first one to read everything that, that I write. So if I don't enjoy it, I'm not going to keep going with it. I'm not going to write something that I hate and then go, here, world, have this pile of crap that I just vomited out. Enjoy, you know, I, I want to love it. And then I want to show it to people and say, I hope you love it, you know, as much as I do or close. In your opinion, what's the most important quality of a writer in in today's world? And how does that translate to what you've created? This is an interesting one because go back 20 years or so um, or 30 years, maybe I, I might have said something different. I mean, I would have been a kid, so that you know, I would have said something stupid. But yeah, it's definitely changed more recently. So there's probably two things. Uh, so the first thing is complete stuff. Get stuff done. There are so many people that want to be writers that I know or that, that have an interest in it never get started or they get started and they never finish it because it's not perfect and it's not you've got to get things done you've got to get your yourself out there you know some of the um the best novelists that i've listened to in their sort of teaching you know they all say the same thing which is you know you need to get your first 20 or so novels done so you can learn how to write a novel uh, you know and it's not that they're all trash but they're going to get better and you need that practice so you can't just agonize over one thing and then release it and and it be this amazing sort of thing you've got to practice your art again and again and again so for me productivity is one of the big things that i think a lot of writers are or should aspire to i suppose is and it's not just getting things out there for the sake of getting them out there but so for instance i just wrote my second screenplay for a grindhouse horror that a friend of mine is, is going to be directing a little bit later on and that was a new experience because that's not my genre. It's not really the area that I, I, I'm involved in, but I thought I'll do it. It's a great experience, really great. Uh, and I thought the more of those I do, the better I will get at writing screenplays, which is something I, I need to get better at. So incidentally, we're going to start another one of those uh, very soon as well. That, so that's the first piece of advice. The second piece of advice, which is the, the big one, you have to get your face out there you have to promote you have to market you have to do all those filthy business things that none of us want to do you have to do it you have to have a central location that people can go to you need to get a website you need all your social media links you've got to be easy for people to find and you've got to have your face out there enough that people can pick up your work we're not in the days anymore where you can go to a traditional publisher and People will magically find your books and to be amazed and then want all of your other books. You have to do the work. You're running a business, which is horrible and soul destroying to say, but it's the truth these days. If you're a writer, if you're an indie writer, you're um, running a business. And part of that business is marketing and promoting and all that horrible, horrible stuff. <laughs> Unfortunately, the necessary evils of, of today's society, like you said, yeah, it's it's not yeah. an easy gig, especially if if it's not your your strengths either, because mm. you feel like you're, especially with social media, you feel like you're badgering and and you know harassing people just to see your work, but you're one of, out of seven billion people that are doing something creative, possibly. That's right, and uh, we run a kickstarter campaign and <laughs> my god during that whole process you are badgering everyone that you know and you feel horrible 
But the way that the algorithms work in social media, only about 5% of people even see those posts. So even though you're spamming and spamming and spamming, most people don't even see. I've, I've run a campaign for 40 odd days, spammed everyone, and then had people afterwards say, oh, I didn't know you had a Kickstarter. <laughs> I think, how, how could you not know? I was yeah. screaming at everyone about this thing. But you're right. It, it's, not, it's not something that comes natural. And it goes back to us being more of an introvert than an extrovert and wanting to focus on the art rather than promotion of the art. I've tried to trick myself essentially to be there's two versions of me there's the there's the writer creative sort of tortured soul you know whatever toiling away in the dark and then there's the money hungry power mad promoter who just will do anything to sell it's almost like i have to have to split the personalities and say well that's the that's the the marketing guy so he's going to be a bit of a dick you know he's going to be that guy he's he's not going to care about spamming he, he will spam everyone he will talk to anyone about this project and you know because that's the only way that things you know get out there but yeah it still is a bit cringeworthy sometimes and you think oh but you got to do it because you're you're both a writer and a musician two very diverse creative fields in their own right what's the most mis misunderstood aspect about being creative in, in either of those fields that maybe the public doesn't quite understand i would say probably the money or the lack of money so as it stands now i've had music in probably 300 or so uh television shows or films or trailers or that sort of stuff so i've written close to maybe 5,000 tracks um i had a lot of music you know in those sort of areas the actual money that you take away from that is so, so small, not consistent enough that you can't live off it. You, you have to have multiple sources of income. You have to have a day job. You have to have some other way of, you know, supporting yourself while you're doing this thing that you love. That's something that people don't get. Classic example. So I, I wrote, a, I sell music loops as part of, part of my, one of my businesses, um, two producers and, and other creators. So I write the music and then put it in a pack and then people buy the pack and they can use it in their own music and that sort of stuff. A French hip hop duo, very well known, released their new album a couple of years ago. And the title track on that album had one of my lo loops looped throughout the whole song. So I didn't know this, of course, because the producers just bought my pack and used it. And it's, so it's all above board. It's all legitimate. It's all fine. All of a sudden, I'm getting spammed an email by people saying, these guys are ripping off your music. They're, you know, It's like this whole thing and it's copyright infringement. And then I had lawyers contacting me saying, you know, oh, we could represent you in this clear case of uh, you know, infringement. And I'm thinking, what, what, what? And then I go and have a look at it and I think, wow, A, it's a pretty cool song, even though I don't speak French, but it's, it's also a cool song because it's got my, my riff all the way through it, which I, I quite happen to like. So I thought, great, fantastic. Did some investigation, tracked it all down and realized, oh no, that's out of one of my loop packs, but it also happens to be in a song that I put out, you know, 10 years earlier. That's just a, a classical guitar. It's called Amber in Bloom is the name of the, of the song. So it's all perfectly legitimate. So I had to get on social media and say, oh, look, it's, it's fine. Everyone, you know, it's all legitimate. Then they didn't steal anything. Everything's cool. Uh, and you could feel this kind of people wanting to be angry about this thing. And I had to sort of diffuse it and say, no, it's fine. It was at, I can't remember how many millions of views. Was, I think it's at 90 million views or something now, you know, and of course that's a lot of money. If you've got a channel that's bringing in that money and people are assuming I would get any of that. I might have gotten $5 for the loop pack that was sold, you know, three years earlier. And that's it. And that, and that's perfectly legitimate. And that's a source of my income, but I need to sell a gazillion of those every year to be able to run, you know, make a living out of it. And then the comic side of things and the writing, but particularly comics, the, the cost of artwork and all the rest of it is so profound and understandably so. I mean, artwork, it takes time. It takes talent. You're paying for the skills of the artist. It's just not a way to quickly make money. That's something that people don't maybe get that you can be out there and doing things and starting to get known for, for things, but you're still not making any money, money out of it. What was an early experience where you learned that language had power? Good question. I would say I was a big fan of fantasy novels when I was younger, you know, the epic sort of series, you know, Robert Jordan and those sorts of things. I think when I was very young, I have a story that I wrote in a cupboard over there uh, when I was seven or eight or something like that. I was, I was quite young and it was a story about a labyrinth and this, you know, this sort of person trying to get out of this 
labyrinth with all these traps and, and you know monsters and stuff in the process of writing that because I, I i pick up that thing and i read it and it's handwritten and it's written on pencil i think the writing is terrible the spelling is terrible grammar is terrible that's all still the same even writing that as horrible as it is I, i'm writing it and thinking yeah the, uh, I like this story. I could I could read this story now and get right in there. So I think that being able to, within a few words, transport myself from where I was in reality to this alternate world with this amazing stuff going on and the, knowing that I could do that, not just, you know, rely on other people, that was amazing. So I think when I first started writing, when I was younger and seeing the power that those words have, that's probably one of the most profound things. And even now, like I say, I could look at it now and it still has that power, even though I would do it completely differently. And it's just, yeah, it's quite, quite touching to think that child me already at that stage had the bug and, and knew kind of what this thing was that, that he was fumbling around with. What's your most recent literary pilgrimage that you've gone on? Well, it would be the uh, the screenplay. So the, the working title is Let's Sacrifice Laura Jean, a grindhouse story, horror story, but with cultic, not quite Cthulhu, but cultic kind of uh, undertones and all that sort of stuff. That was interesting and different because not only was I writing a screenplay, which I've done before, but this was a screenplay for something that I knew was going to get made. So this wasn't, uh, let's let's write a screenplay and put it out there and hope that, you know, this will be one out of the gazillions that are out there that someone will pick up. This was actually, no, no, this guy's going to make this thing. He already has the actors lined up. We have the essential idea ready. I just need to write the thing and get it done. That was a really interesting and stretching kind of thing to do. I, I love writing screenplays because it, you just eliminate the faff. You don't have to describe how do they get from there to there. And it's, it's just prim primarily dialogue and action and like this, this, and this. And so it's so smooth and easy to write. And you're really just getting down to the ideas, which I found uh, amazing. So it was the reverse way around. Cause normally you would write it and then they would cast, you know, on the back of what you've written. But this was kind of going the reverse way where I kind of, I could see the images of the people that were going to play these roles and thinking what would sound good coming out of that character's mouth? What would this be? And which is really hard because I don't know any of them. I've never met them. So that was a, a really interesting uh, exercise. And fortunately it worked out well and the director was happy with, with the, the end product, but that was, that was a stretch and it was different and exciting and new and also a genre I'm not, not really that familiar with. Yeah, that was great fun. And as I said, we're doing it again, potentially going to be doing it again, uh, potentially with a Western theme this time around, which should be great again, because I have to go back to the 1800s and, you know, have that sort of old Western dialogue and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, I, I love that. I, I love the creativity of just, you know, you get five people together, put together a script, put together a short film of some kind and yeah you know and get it out there and the fact that features are and i've worked on a few features too but the the features just seeing like how the progress is not as linear as the script is uh, especially when the filming starts it's it's amazing how it gets all pieced together yeah and i i couldn't stop my brain from drifting into that and i'm thinking how would how would they even do this like what which even something as simple as how many night scenes am i doing how many scenes am i doing where there's rain you know, because it's not, they're going to have to either have a rain machine, which would cost the earth, or they're going to have to wait for rain. You know, so there's all those little things that I had to stop myself thinking about because that's the director's job that he'll, he'll sort all that out. But yeah, it was really interesting. At what point are we good enough? Okay, then this is an interesting one. Uh, I think there are two predominant uh, demons within creators or within writers. Uh, there's probably more, but the simple fight, there's two that I, that I know of. One is the nothing I do is ever good enough. Uh, I need to keep working and make it perfect. And that's quite a common one, you know, the perfectionist kind of thing. The other one, I don't have that one, the perfectionist one. The one that I have is it's never enough. You've never done enough. You need to do more. You need to do better. You need to do quicker. You need to do, you know, whatever, you know, you run a Kickstarter campaign, you, you reach X amount of dollars. Well, I've already forgotten that you need to do more, you know, so I have this drive constantly pushing me more, 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 more. So complete and get it done and get it out there rather than make it perfect. 
which is actually of the two demons, that's the one I would prefer because it means you you're not stuck in a rut. You can get things out there, um, and you you can be a little bit forgiving with you know what they're not perfect. Nothing is going to be perfect, and if I waited for for for, for, for perfection, um, nothing would happen. In my mind, if it is done and I've reread it and I like it and I would potentially walk in and pick this up and buy it, then I'm good. Um, as long as I'm, I'm happy that it's good enough that I would pick it up and, and buy it, um, then I'm, I'm done. And then because invariably everything that I've done, I, I will look back over and see all the mistakes and see all the things I would do differently and time and money. Uh, if someone came over and gave me a gazillion dollar check, you know, I would be going right back through the catalog and redoing everything from scratch. But then there's also this being part of being an indie creator, I think is, is having things that, ha that aren't perfect, that are a little bit on the edge and that maybe the, the wording is a bit different. And the, the other thing as well, this is a bit of a bugbear of mine. So there's all these rules, particularly within comics about what you do and don't do with, you know, lettering and pages and panels and all this sort of stuff. There's all, all the rules. And one of the big things as a writer is don't go overboard with the writing. You're not writing prose or you're not writing a novel. So, you know, you need to keep the text tight and, and sharp and pointed and all that sort of stuff. Put a lot of effort into doing that. Then I read Promethea. Is it Promethea? From, oh, now I'm going to forget the name of one of the biggest comic writers in the world. Uh, he wrote Swamp Thing. Alan. Alan Moore. Alan Moore. Or, um, uh, Neil Gaiman, uh, or Gaiman, the um, Sandman series. You read those, those, there are way too many words in those things. Those guys <laughs> break all the rules from the start. They, they, there's, there's way too wordy. They're, they're not making much effort apparently at all to sort of, you know, control themselves or to, to meet the demands of the, of the, um, the genre or the, the medium. And so I think, well, you know, well, we can do anything then, you know, even those, those guys that are so well regarded, they, they don't stick to the, the rules. And I get the whole, you got to learn the rules before you break them. But I think, nah, just, just break them. That's been a bugbear of mine. Cause I'm, I'm reading, uh, yeah, one of Alan Moore's ones that I hadn't read before. And I'm just thinking there's so many words I, I would, <laughs> you know, I would get so criticized for using so many words and the type of language as well. Like, wow, man, it's just dense stuff that's why especially with alan moore's watchman while it's it's critically acclaimed and it's a very well written comic as well too if you compare that versus the movie it's almost exactly page for page scene for scene it is so mm. a literal translation to live action it's pretty pretty amazing in its own right yeah but apparently he hates every movie that's ever been done of his, his work, which is the prerogative of the, of the, um, the writer to be crusty and, you know, hate everything and just fits with the whole, whole theme. Yeah. That's his, that's his, um, his persona. I mean, hmm. it, it yeah, exactly. Where, whereas mine is great. Do it, do it, whatever. Hollywood, pick up sure. my, my script, ruin the movie, murder my plots. That's fine. Send me the money. I don't care. As long as it's out there, it can be as bad as you want it. And then I can get on social media and say, yeah, it was terrible. I hated it. They really did a hatchet job on this. But consider buying the book because the book is, you know, really good. <laughs> Go for it. Why not? Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? <sighs> <laughs> this should be easier to answer than what it is. I would say a, a writer like uh, Robert Jordan or Terry Brooks, one of the old style fantasy uh, writers, because that was where the passion really came from for me as, as a kid and just seeing what they could do. That was the most inspiring, just not knowing the creators or anything, but just the worlds that they created were so inspiring and yeah, uh, formative for the way I, I now think and create. So I'd say, let's go Robert Jordan. Why not? We'll go with a classic. Anyone personal? I have a terrible memory. I mean, there was probably, uh, there was one English teacher when I was very young, whose name I can't remember. Uh, she was very kind and sort of suggested I, I do more with the creative writing. I, do, I have a friend, Sasha, if you're watching Sasha and, uh, and Ryan, her uh, now husband, 
because of, you know, very recently they got married, very recently. They have been very big supporters, particularly with the comics and the more recent things that I've done. And Sasha's always been uh, great as someone that's, that's excited and bouncing ideas off and all that sort of stuff. And so they're, they're kind of the group that they're my first readers after I've sort of written something and always supportive and all that sort of stuff. So yeah, they're quite inspiring too. From a professional standpoint, you have created many works, both prose and comics, and you have created, of course, music as well, too, that many people all over the world love in that regard. So professionally, you are successful in, in many different fields. Do you consider yourself personally successful? Uh, I would say yes, even though it's hard to say that because I feel like I'm the, whole, the old imposter syndrome coming in. I would say Yes, but continuing to get better and better. I'd say provisionally, yes. I think I found a nice balance between work, creativity, family, and I'm doing the thing that I love. I always say, even if you know Netflix came and gave me three limited series and I was rolling in money and all that sort of stuff, I would still essentially be doing the same thing I am now, which is writing, creating, thinking of new ideas, editing, all that stuff. In a way, that's that's the picture of success for me. I'm doing the thing that I love to do and getting paid for it, you know, even if it's not mucho money and mucho fame. But yeah, so let's say yes, provisionally yes. The reverse of success but, is failure. How do you deal with your failures? Uh, I move on very quickly and try and learn what I can I have a terrible memory, which is great when it comes to uh, failure, because you just, you, you tend to be a bit more positive, I think, because you're like, well, I, don't, I can't remember that that was that bad. But also everything adds to who you are and who you're going to be and what success you have in the future and all that sort of stuff. So the my first Kickstarter campaign, for example, I did all the printing uh, and postage from Australia, but I printed in America, posted them back to Australia, then posted them largely back to America. So I lost all my money because of a silly little thing. The one, the campaigns I run now, I have an American printer, like a US printer and an Aussie printer. But when I was first starting, I made every mistake possible. Yes, it would be great to avoid all of that, but all of that kind of adds to the tapestry of who I am and what I've learned. Yeah, I tend not to get hung up on on that. The other thing is being a writer, I've heard it described as being a boxer. You know, if you're going to get in the ring, you've got to expect to get hit. It's just part of the nature of things. So the quicker you can just get up, dust off your boots, and then on you go, I think the better. So I just keep busy, keep moving, and don't stress too much, but try and where there are things that I can change or good feedback that's like, hey, if you did that differently, that might be better. Learn from it, give it a go. Yeah, and see where it goes from there. The younger generation is looking at your work and they become inspired to be creative in their own way. And the fact that you have the younger generation with you, maybe they're being inspired to be creative in, in writing or comics or music or whatever they would like to be creatively. But how can they inspire the generation that follows them? I think in this age where there's so much content and so much uh, rapid fire media and social media and all that sort of stuff, I think the way that they can inspire future generations is to almost go against the grain, find something that they love and run with it, but do it their own way. Don't do it the way that everyone else is doing it. And you know, I think in the future, people are going to want to find things that are different, not things that are the same necessarily, because there's so much homogenous sort of stuff out there so i think find your unique thing or the thing that you love and, and do it and do it well and people will find you it sounds a bit cliched now that i think about it but that's all i have for the the future generation kids stay in school <laughs> don't do drugs and that other thing that i said that i've now forgotten because of terrible memory if your life was a, a film or a comic book or TV series or whatever it may be, what would its title be? And the fact that you're a musician as well, I'll add this in. What would its soundtrack be? Oh, God, you end with a, with a big one. So the title would be Open Your Mind Mouth and Eat the World because it's the perfect amount of weirdness. I have used that phrase from time to time, and I don't know what it is about it, but I just love it. So yes, open your mind, mouth, and eat the world. The, the, the music would be, I think, an eclectic 
I would grab a bunch of things from the the nineties primarily, like <laughs> your Jamiroquais and those those types of bands. Maybe a bit of Nirvana, maybe a bit of a System of the Down. Maybe I, I would have things con- connected that you wouldn't normally connect in an in an album together. Um, of songs that I've I've loved uh, growing up and in the '90s in particular, right? Just mash right in no particular order, not in a way that doesn't make sense. Something very soft and and you know some sort of maybe flamenco music, and then you know chop suey by System of a Down or something right next to it, and you know a mishmash. That's the way to go. Well, Morgan, I do hate to say it, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me, Kurt. It's been a blast. Before I let you go, where can we find you? How can we support you? And of course, where can we support you online and social media and everything like that? Well, I've, as I said earlier, I have one site, people. That's <laughs> the way to do it. So everything is at morganquaid.com. Uh, you can go there, you find all my social media. You'll find latest projects. Uh, when I launch Kickstarter next month for Enmity, I'll add that up there. There are links to books you can buy and all that sort of stuff, as well as some of the music. Um, And by all means, uh, hit me up if there's a question. Uh, I'm also looking for um, reviewers and readers for um, advanced copies of novels and those sorts of things. So if that's you, if you like reading and and reviewing stuff, by all means, get in touch or just get in touch to have a chat. Um, Also, if you're, you know, interested in comic creation or anything like that and you want to ask a question, get in touch. Why not? morganquaid.com it's nice and easy well like i said that ends this particular episode of two geeks talking you could of course find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website tgtmedia.com or two geeks talking.com that's the word two not the number two and of course our youtube channel which is a lot more updated than our website i'm doing what i can give me a break i'm only one person <laughs> is youtube.com forward slash tgt media and as i say every week everyone has a story to tell it's up to me to help bring that out Thanks for listening, watching on Two Geeks Talking.